Seriously, what is Industry 4.0? Sometimes clients ask me, and they um, are under the impression that it could be a new technology, new methodology, but certainly that's not true. According to the uh, official narrative, it's the fourth industrial revolution. So let's take a look at that. In this tradition, it would follow three other industrial revolutions. First would have been the invention of the steam engine, uh, the, uh, invented by Mr. Watt, then the assembly line, you could attribute that to Mr. Ford, and then factory automation. Uh, Mr. Morley is the, the inventor of the PLC. Uh, he did the first design for Modicon. And the uh, common feature with all those three events is that it's disruptive technology, a disruptive invention, with large-scale impact on the economy. That's the common thread here, okay? And in this tradition, some uh, see this next movement, Industry 4.0. So, uh, it's about cyber-physical systems. And the innovator, in this case, is not an engineer, it's the German government with the Merkel administration. It's a government-driven effort, and um, Chancellor Merkel made it very clear that the German industry would have to do that, and they would have to lead uh, this effort globally. Uh, in this picture, you see her explaining the concept uh, to Siemens executives. So, what, is, uh, what am I missing here? Um, I think there are a couple of things. First, um, what is a cyber-physical system? Where can you buy it? I would imagine that um, the, the pundits who, in, uh, who coined the term and, and, uh, and tell you, well, this is the, the new thing in, in, uh, in this new industrial revolution, they most likely will never have read uh, the groundbreaking book Cybernetics by Norbert Wiener. So, obviously, there is no real conceptual difference between factory automation as we know it and cyber-physical systems. That's the same concept. So, our PLCs, our industrial control systems, always have been cyber-physical systems. Uh, isn't that strange? And uh, also, if you ask, uh, well, where would you buy cyber-physical systems as an asset owner. You, you, you want to go for Industry 4.0, so where, where would you buy those new systems? Well, surprise, it's, it's the same vendors, right? But you didn't buy your first PLC from uh, the company who sold you the assembly line. That's, isn't that strange? In other words, the emperor is buying his new clothes from the old tailor. Um, there are a couple of other things that, um, let's just say, spoil the narrative. So if you look at those previous industrial revolutions, it's never about innovative technology. It becomes an industrial revolution only if it has some large-scale economic and social impact. So there must be economic drivers. In all those three precedents, we have seen pervasive cost reduction. Not we, everybody has seen that. They were driven by pervasive cost reduction. And if you look at Industry 4.0 with the cyber-physical systems, everybody sees a perceived cost increase. So if you follow the, uh, um, the reporting on Industry 4.0, you cannot miss the fact that pretty much every asset owner is complaining on two things. First is cost. Second is cybersecurity issues. How strange is that? Uh, there have been a couple of studies on that. PwC recently estimated that uh, the asset owners will need to spend 900 billion euro per year. That's the global, the global uh, figure. And, uh, you know, that's a bit different. People are expecting some economic benefits, um, and now we are told, well, it's going to cost a shitload of money. How does that compute? So why would anybody uh, want to go for that? 
Well, uh, as the narrative goes, uh, the idea is increase digital complexity in your plants by an order of magnitude or else go out of business. Your trustworthy OTN network vendors. So that's like the threat. Um, it is assumed that if you don't do it, even if you cannot see any uh, business uh, benefits at this time, you might go out of business in the future, let's just say in 10 or 20 years. So you better start increasing your um, digital complexity. Uh, but wait a second, certainly there is more to that. So I'm, I don't want to oversimplify. There is a disruptive paradigm associated with Industry 4.0. It's not all bullshit, so, so there, there is something that we can evaluate. And this disruptive paradigm is autonomous control and self-configuration, certainly something that we are presently not doing. And um, so this is a quote from uh, the predominant document uh, in this space, so it's from, uh, it was written, or it was sponsored by the German government, it's like the official agenda uh, for Industry 4.0, and uh, the vision that is um, proposed in this, in this document is that, the, that uh, those cyber-physical systems will be autonomous, capable of controlling themselves in respect to different situations, and self-configuring. How cool is that? So I want you to focus on, on this idea or on this concept. First, uh, the first question I have is, is this really an indicator of a disruptive technology that could um, prompt um, societal change and economic change as we have seen it before? And what you see in all those other industrial revolutions in the past, is that they were using a common sense paradigm followed by everybody as obvious good business. So it's always technology, common sense paradigm, which leads to something that will result in obvious good business. Um, so I've, uh, I've pulled a quote from the uh, leading piece of, of work, uh, the, the piece of literature uh, for industrial um, revolutions and financial capital. And the quote goes, externalities of all sorts are so overwhelmingly favorable to it that engineers, designers, managers, entrepreneurs and investors naturally follow certain common principles as obvious and good business. Do we see that with Industry 4.0? Well, you just answer that yourself. The next question uh, that I have uh, in respect to autonomous control and self-configuration uh, is, where's the science for this? Are we talking about science or science fiction? Uh, this is another quote I have pulled for you uh, from the most quoted, the most cited paper on autonomous control. And uh, the punchline is, that uh, the authors think that autonomous systems present significant challenges well beyond current capabilities. Hmm. Now this paper, let's be honest, is it was written like uh, 15 years ago, so maybe those geniuses at the vendors have overcome the challenges. They have found good engineering solutions for that. Uh, so let's look at another question. And this is probably most important for all of us here in this room because this is a cybersecurity conference. What are the security implications? And I, I think uh, this is something that uh, everybody talking about Industry 4.0 should really think hard about. Um, so keep in mind self-configuration. One question would be, who would you, uh, how would you determine if an autonomous configuration change is authorized or not, if it's legitimate or not? Well, the fact is presently we don't have a concept for that. We don't know. If you figure that out, please tell us, please tell everybody, that's a very difficult problem. In other words, your um, autonomous controller would all of a sudden use a different configuration. How do you determine that this change of configuration is legitimate 
or malicious? I don't know. If you have an idea, please elaborate on that. Um, how do you determine a baseline configuration? You know, that's one of our uh, major approaches in, in OT security. Uh, you need a baseline configuration that you are confident with is legitimate. And then you can uh, try to detect changes by network monitoring, by file integrity monitoring, etc., etc., etc. But how do you determine a baseline configuration in an environment that self modifies? I don't know. If you have a good idea, please tell us. Uh, how do you detect anomalies? Is that configuration change? Is that event-driven behavior? Uh, is that a good anomaly or a bad anomaly? Or is that, is that just normal? In other words, um, several of our um, everyday security concepts and methods will not work in such an environment. And I would say your best case would be you get false positives all over the place. And finally, for the engineering types amongst, among you, um, how do you predict machine behavior? That's one of the core uh, aspects of control, is predictability. But in a self-modifying environment, how can you predict what the behavior of that PLC, that machine, that robot, etc., will be in an hour or next day? There could be uh, good answers to that, but I, I haven't seen those. And I think um, we need to address and, and discuss all those issues before uh, we would seriously go about implementing such a concept at a large scale. But let's just assume that uh, all this um, hype around self-modifying controls, etc., cetera, um, would just be hype. And in reality, it's mostly about more practical things like, uh, you know, these sensors, these digital sensors, network sensors have become so damn cheap. Why don't we just throw a couple hundred into our existing environment and uh, take advantage of that? What could possibly go wrong? Well, if you ask me, I would say a lot of things could go wrong. Um, because most likely what you're going to end up with will not be very different from all those legacy environments that we were complaining about today. You know, because back in the 90s, everybody was uh, considering IT just, like an ad, just as an add-on. So it was just thrown in there, you know, it's insignificant. No problem if it would fail. Uh, we don't care about availability and, and, and integrity, etc., because it's just an add on. So, this is how it all started. And this is what brought us this is the attitude, the mindset that brought us those highly complex, undocumented, chaotic environments that we are faced with today, which are usually referred to as legacy systems. And the excuse that asset owners usually present to you when confronted with that chaos is, well, you know, that's like they, they have, though all those systems have grown organically and they were designed without security in mind. And guess what? You will be continuing in that same mindset if you tell me, well, what, what could possibly go wrong if we just throw in a couple of hundred more digital sensors? I can tell you what, what's, what will go wrong. So you will end up with a bunch of undocumented and unplanned links, control paths, etc., uh, which will certainly affect your maintainability. You will uh, just wrap yourself up in connections that you don't really know about, but all of a sudden, you know, five years later, you determine, wow, you know, some important part of our production is relying on that, just like we have seen it over and over again. Um, the second thing I would like to point out, there are the side effects are not just important for maintainability, but also for reliability and even safety. Uh, earlier this year at S4 in Miami, I uh, did a talk on th that uh, um, touched on nuclear safety systems. And I made the point that I can demonstrate to you in a fully digital environment 
I can create a safety risk for an operational nuclear power plant without touching the digital safety system. So you could even use an analog safety system. And I can still create a safety risk by messing with digital normal process control. Because this would allow me to take the plant out of the design parameters for the safety system. Uh, I think the, the video recording of that talk will be uh, probably out in a couple of weeks, so it's going to be published, and I um, um, ask you to take a look at that. Um, so I think um, this is something we need to address. So let's forget about all the hype. Let's just assume that um, the industry will go that way. We will see much more uh, digital complexity. And uh, what should we consider to not repeat the same mistakes over and over again? So I certainly believe that, this, uh, that growing digital complexity in our plants is inevitable um, for, uh, for a very simple reason. All those digital systems are cheaper and, more, and much more convenient. Then if we take that as a fact, if we agree on that, what needs to be done? And in my opinion, um, I think we, we need to focus on, on two items that um, presently present a challenge. The first item would be you need to manage your OT environment, your systems, your components, you need to manage your configuration. In other words, we, we definitely need to get rid of those uh, systems that grow organically. This is just another word for um, lack of planning. So if, if you don't apply this idea of management and governance, monitoring uh, uh, your um, assets, etc., I think you are going to be in big trouble. Because uh, what we see presently is that uh, asset owners are already drowning in the digital complexity they have. And if you increase that by an order of magnitude, um, I don't want to be in your uh, uh, maintenance guy's shoes and certainly not in your OT security guy's shoes. The other thing I believe uh, will become the uh, dominant theme of the future, I would, I would expect that in a couple of years we will see a couple of talks on security automation. Because, let's face it, at this time already we are struggling. Because uh, with the environments we have, securing those environments is, in most cases, already beyond our, our capacity. It's not rocket science, and I, and I really like the way that, that Dale uh, coined it earlier in his opening talk. It's not rocket science. We can do it. We see uh, impressive improvements, but we are running out of capacity. And certainly, there is no way that we could scale up our uh, fleet, our, our uh, army of human Experts. I mean, it's great to see the S4 conference growing and growing every year, but we are just a couple of hundred guys. That's not enough. That just won't fly. So uh, if we don't manage uh, for that next step to invent and, and, uh, and use some good uh, security automation strategies, we will be lost we will be in a, in a much bigger mess than many asset owners are in today. And certainly, uh, they, don't, they will not recognize it uh, in, in the next one or two years, but it's getting worse and worse. And the, f and, the, and the big question will be, once that you are there, can you still reverse? How, how do you recover? Yeah, I know it's pessimistic, but this time I need to close on a pessimistic note. Thank you very much. <laughs>